I'm Piercy Janwell, and you're listening to Unsubscribed. Every episode, I sit down with business leaders to help you question everything you thought you knew about marketing. If you enjoy this show, please do subscribe and leave a review on YouTube or your favorite podcast player. Now, on to this episode. My guest today is Hilary Headley. Hillary has over 20 years of go-to-market operating experience in both B2B and B2C, including most recently the head of go-to-market sales and enablement at Zoom uh, before she became the executive vice president of sales and customer success at Insight Partners. She has an amazing track record of being part of two IPOs at Zoom and Alteryx and three exits at MindBody, Lynda.com, and Econoculture. So great to have you on the Unsubscribe podcast, Hillary. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Pierce, very much. I appreciate it. I'm really excited about our conversation today. I'd love to hear more about your take on sales operations and how companies can scale their go-to-market. I'd love to hear maybe first a little bit more about how you got into sales operations and SaaS. Sure. So I think like many people in sales operations, I didn't set out to do that. I didn't know in the 80s and 90s when I was growing up that that even existed. What I did know was in college, there was an internship at a radio station and they wanted someone to come and help with, they called it their client database. And I went, well, radio sounds kind of fun. Maybe I'll see what that can that can do. And what they really wanted me to do was keep all their contacts clean and organized and structured. Their CRM, as we know it today, it was actually called ACT Database. And that's where I realized two things. One, I really liked the system side of things and working in that environment. And two, I really liked being on the sales floor. It was full of vibrant, fun folks. And I'm like, this is a great environment. I don't want to do that, but I really like supporting that that function. And so future roles then kind of all had a similar note where there was always some type of CRM database, analytical data side of it. And for a while I was customer facing and customer success. And then because I liked training customers, they're like, can you train internal people as well? And that's where the back in the day it was called sales training, but that's where the enablement side comes from. And over the years, I just really looked at it as general sales support. What are all the things that need to happen across strategy, planning, process, systems, design, data, training, you know, all the things that really need to be there to make sure that our really our customers are successful, but by way of our our sales leaders. And that's really how I got into uh, kind of core sales operations and enablement. Um, with a backbone and an early beginning in customer success, all through uh, radio, which I know is not a medium as popular today, mm-hmm. but it was it was pretty big back in the 90s and early 2000s. That's amazing. We we have a lot of marketing operations professionals who tune into the podcast, and we've had a lot of marketing ops leaders on, and it's a lot of similar stories. You know, you know, the marketing ops is also a newer field. And a lot of people kind of stumble their way into it. I feel sales ops might be a little bit ahead of marketing ops. And I was just part of a study about how there's really this shortage of marketing ops professionals. How do you feel the training and the education is on the sales operation side of things? And do you feel that there's the same kind of crunch there for that talent? For the what? For what was the last? For the day? sale, for the sales operations talent. Talent. I think the training has gotten much better over the years. When I was first doing, it was actually product operations and sales operations at the time at the company you mentioned called Iconoculture. Um, there wasn't even LinkedIn, so it was there, but it wasn't what it is today, where you could find a group and maybe even see a framework of how you structure it. Or there weren't things like, wow, can I go and see how compensation plans can be modeled? That just didn't exist. You were really on an island. Since you know, the many of us started in Salesforce was the common one. You know, Back in the day, Dreamforce was a fabulous way for sales operations folks to get together and go, how are you managing not only your Salesforce instance, but all the other things around it? And I think that's when sales operations really exploded is when the groups went, 
we are just, we are more than a system. There is so much more that we are responsible for and that we want to do and can do. And that's where I think sales operations has really shifted. I think it's shifted heavily with the product release cycles and how fast things can come to market. And I think it's changed with how honestly excellent marketing has gotten at all of their different disciplines from brand marketing to SEO to PLG. All of those items have really then pushed it to sales operations. Think of that as supporting maybe our customer facing friends to make sure that they have what they need so customers are successful. So I think the training has definitely gone from very systems focused or system admin focused to very spreadsheet and analyst focused, which are the two, I think, common starting grounds for a lot of us in operations. But it's shifting to how can I understand that full go to market motion and be that advisor for not, not only maybe a CRO, a CFO or a COO, but help with a CMO, a CPO, a CISO, a CIO and a CEO, just all the C-level folks to make sure um, that that is understood, that the strategies do align out to those customers and that that throughput is really there for those folks. In contrast to marketing ops, gosh, marketing ops, I think, has taken such a really fun strategic shift that I'm so excited to see. I always loved parking, uh, partnering with my marketing ops teams. They were amazing analysts. They really, really understood the principles of a customer journey, I think, ahead of sales operations. They really understood deep analytic looks at how things should be done with a, da with a data-driven kind of decision versus a have a gut feel there. I think there's a lot that sales ops can and should learn from marketing ops. And I think that's where this revenue ops concept is cool. It can have them mm -hmm. combined under the same reporting structure. It can have them separate and, and maybe some services that they share. But there's just a ton that I think each group can learn from, from one another on that. Marketing apps to me, though, is it's, it's taking those leaps and bounds. And I'm excited to see kind of, you know, where it goes in the next year and so forth. Yeah, that's awesome. I love to hear your thoughts on that. And, and, and it's interesting because, yeah, I, I've been hearing a lot about revenue ops. You know, it's not necessarily a new uh, group, but there seems to be more and more talk about it. How do you see companies actually implement that? Like, if they already have strong sales ops, strong marketing ops, is it a new person that comes in to lead revenue ops? Or do they promote sort of the strongest person? How, how have you seen that actually operationalized? Yeah. Yeah, the easy answer is that it depends. And those dependencies, I think, are things like this. Reporting structure can matter, right, if you want to get that continuity there. So if you need to have your marketing ops and your sales ops report through to the same person, ideally, the person who would be leading that group has experience in both disciplines. For those of us from 10, 15 years ago doing sales ops, we frequently had a marketing branch under us, a customer success. At times, we were also running channel and solutions engineering. We just didn't call it that. It was just sales ops and had those notes. The difference is, though, everything has gotten more complex and there's a higher level of strategy that needs to happen. So it can sit under one roof and I think it can do that. And we have companies in the portfolio that do that very well at some of the stages of growth. I think there are other models where perhaps if you have a direct selling model, a channel selling model and an e-commerce model, it might be a little heavy for one person to have all of those sales motions and then a marketing ops motion under one group. But frequently, Pierce, it can come down to how the, the C-levels are structured. If marketing is already through to a CRO, and let's say that's where that's being reported through, that can be a natural kind of follow-on mm -hmm. for that group. And then another option that we've seen is where our RevOps groups report through to, for example, a CFO or a COO, and they sit between the CMO and the CRO and are able to run the core process mm -hmm. systems and data in a little more of a neutral manner, if you will, versus reporting up and through. So the long way of saying it depends, and there's not one answer for every company. It really is taking a look at things like your go-to-market motion, the stage and size of your business, where your maybe strong leaders can um, align and make sure that that cross-functional partnership really is humming and solid and moving the business forward. Reporting to a CFO, that that is interesting. I actually 
Yeah, yeah, that's sort of new to me. I would imagine I could see the benefits of that mm -hmm. on sort of the numbers and the financial accuracy and what they would need to do their forecasts. And I could also foresee some challenges there around the needing a, a CFO that has really good marketing and sales understanding as well. But I, yeah. that's an interesting model. Yeah, we just actually hosted our fourth annual revenue operations summit two weeks ago. And uh, there was a fair amount of our RevOps leaders there that report through to their CFO. There's a, if you think of it through an interlock lens, there's a mm -hmm. strong interlock um, with any type of planning that needs to go through typically your FP&A or your CFO yeah. or office of your, your CFO function that's there. There's also strong interlocks. I've walked into um, some some sales ops teams and they've been reporting through to the CIO. And hmm. there's just, it's a, they can really report anywhere. It also depends on what services they're offering. If they're yeah. offering strategic planning and analysis, yeah, that could work really well with the CFO. If they're offering more process and systems, that might work really well in a COO or in maybe a smaller CIO function. The majority of where you see it, though, is through a CRO um, in those areas. And then I think that just depends on what are those go-to-market mm -hmm. motions? Where can you get the best kind of positive tension? And then the alignment that you need to, again, make sure that the customer journey is smooth and that everything that those teams who are supporting the customers have what they need to succeed so that the customers are good to go. Yeah, we're, we're in our financial planning right now for next year. And I can see our CFO is very entrenched with our yeah. with our ops teams to try and figure out all the numbers and and the data to do budgeting and everything. So yeah. that, that's and the super programs. interesting. Yeah, yeah, and in the programs to support it, Pearson. I think that's yeah. the two sides of the coin. There's the data and the analysis that is so key, but it's the what are the programs to support this that can really be done. And that's where finance and ops, I think, play such a great role and where marketing and sales play a great role. Anything from product to marketing, all those go to market teams saying, this is how we're going to make the number. If you help tell us what it is top down or we can help deliver that bottom up, we want to tell you how we're going to do that and then make sure that those are measured and managed too, so that the company sees success. Super interesting. <laughs> um, and not a way that I necessarily thought about it before. So I, I appreciate this perspective. Um, one, one thing that I wanted to dig in a little bit more on, you talked a little bit about working with your marketing counterparts. Uh, you know, sales and marketing alignment is something that we've been talking about forever. But I'm curious from your perspective on the teams that you worked on, you know, what did you see between sales ops and marketing ops? What were some things that kind of the best teams were doing? Yeah, there's, I have, I feel really lucky. I feel like I've always had very strong marketing ops teams who they want to align. And what I mean by that is we're never going to agree a hundred percent on everything, but how can we get 80% of the way there and know that that's the right thing? For example, um, when I was at Alteryx, we had a lot of discussion around defining an MQL. And those were really positive debates put through a data lens. We really looked at attribution. Then from there, was it first touch, final touch, multi-touch attribution? We met on it a fair amount and came to something that we could align on and have a united front and then make sure that we could manage that out to the business. We were also open to changing it if there was you know, a need to do that. And so for me, it really comes down to you have to be open to learning what might be a discipline that you aren't maybe as familiar with, coming up with a plan, understanding the pros and cons, also being you know, open to sharing your thoughts, and then rolling something out with a unified front. Even if you don't agree with 20% of it or you still have some challenges, that's a really important piece, I think, to move forward on. Other areas that it's worked really well is around anything on kind of lead routing, lead enrichment, lead alignment. So there's been various lead routing models that I've been able to work in from the top reps get the top leads to no matter what the lead kind of type or quality is, it just goes over to a rep to make sure that they're, they're working with a customer. All of these have an implication on conversion rates, which then impact maybe what the goal is 
for marketing to help achieve the number. Each of those need their own discussions and plans and to make sure that they're being managed and measured appropriately from the business. I think the best way that I've always been able to align with marketing right away is a rep doesn't own a lead, the business owns the lead. What is the philosophy at this company for how we can make sure that it is handled and cared for in the best way? And I think sometimes just knowing um, what those really important tenets are can move the ball forward between sales ops and marketing ops. For me, it's always a very strong Venn diagram, and it's usually lead enrichment, lead assignment, lead routing, lead qualification, lead conversion. Really, a lot of things converge around that. Where marketing ops, I think, plays such a powerful role is in upstream metrics from that. So what about website views, website page views, how long they're there, the different lead forms that want to be tried, and what could that could bring? I love that marketing ops, in at least my experiences, have owned that and run that. I know enough about it to even mention it in, like, in this podcast. I don't know the level two, three, four, five on that. Mm-hmm. And that's where I think that trust in, that's what you know and are so good at, go and do that. But where we have this Venn diagram and it starts to get into you know, maybe what we send to our sales folks and what they need to do to reduce the noise in some of these areas, let's have those discussions. And then we'll also own these other areas that maybe you're not as excited about either. Perhaps quota setting you know, where commission plans aren't as exciting for folks in marketing ops. But I think they are, though, and I kind of like that. I kind of like that shift, too. So I hope that answers your question, Pierce. No, for sure. And I love how you have these kind of diagrams and models. (laughs) Like, I've read some of uh, your blog posts and, and a few other interviews. And that's one thing I've noticed that I think makes you a great leader is that you're able to kind of categorize these different things and make it very clear for people who owns what or what where the focus should be yeah. um, in, in these different models. Well, thank you. Anybody who listens to this that has worked with me will laugh at that because they will say that I am very good at bucketing and alliteration. But I think there are two things, though, that if you can, I'm a big believer I'm very chatty. I can get long winded. And I learned a couple years ago from one of my employees, they said, when you can draw it in a picture on a slide and explain it, I know that you know it really well. And so I've tried to get to that point in some of these areas to say, this is where I think we can get clarity and alignment is through a really clear either picture or drawing. And then folks start to use that and we can go back to that versus just what somebody heard or said. So my audio memory can be a little light, Mm. but if I can go back to that drawing and we can come back to that drawing together, I think it's even more important to move the ball forward. It also, Pierce, helps then when you have to get other folks in your department to align. If there's a single visual or two that show what we, and by we, I'll say it specifically as what marketing and sales are doing together, where we have the marketing sales ops equation, that can be really powerful to have the same drawing and the same examples that are going to leaders to show that alignment and it makes it real. And I think, I think that's been really powerful. Yeah. I love that. Uh, my drawing is really bad. So um, I need our, <laughs> our graphics team help for that, but yeah, they're pretty cheesy, but if it, again, if it, if it has that light bulb moment of, Oh, yeah. That's what you mean. And that yeah, happens yeah. for me a lot. Somebody will go, can I just whiteboard this? And I swear that's when I, I'm, and I'm always like, yes. And I swear that's when the light bulb goes off for me. Of, that's what you meant. I couldn't yes. click that when I heard it, but the minute yeah. you drew it, I get it too. So it's also really helpful on the reverse side that I sometimes need to see what people mean. Love it. Um, okay. Uh, those are some great tips. I think, a big part of uh, having a successful team all comes down to the people. And so one thing that I'd love to hear from your perspective, it's like when you look to hire people in your sales ops teams, what, what kind of things were you looking for? Like, were there certain qualities or experience that you found give someone a better chance of being really good at ops? My initial instinct is to say no, 
because I've hired folks in sales operations just across the gamut. So for example, there's folks that have come from finance who feel like a natural analyst fit and that can work really well. I've had some BDRs who've been able to make the shift um, very seamlessly, which I've loved. I think BDRs are like the gold mine for what every department should be looking at sometimes at a company for those areas. Mm Um, have had folks from sales themselves make the move over into what that into what that needed to be. Um, not always operations, but an enablement. Goodness, there were some amazing teachers that made the shift over um, to help to come with curriculum design and some of those areas that needed to happen. So for me, it's not been uh, oh, and anyone that's done um, retail and public facing work. I tell you, those folks are ready to lock in and know how to partner and listen and drive forward in those areas. So for me, there's there, there's not a there's not an ideal background. I think what's more important is during the interview and kind of hiring process, are they an effective listener? And what I mean by that is, are they able to absorb the information that I am sharing with them, like the problems, maybe two or three problems that we have? Are they, they don't need to address it in the call, but are they proactively and naturally following up and providing guidance on that? So for me, there's cues that people can do where I don't need them to be an on the spot, like hands down best interview ever, but I do need them to be effectively listening and maybe tying together how they would solve and be proactive in sharing that moving forward. So there's, there's things that you can't always test for, like anticipation, desire to problem solve, ability to clearly communicate both listening, writing, and speaking. But you can get that through the overall interview process that I think can be um, a good way to see if they might be a fit for sales operations. But at the end of the day, the first test, quote unquote, that you must pass, I think, to be in sales operations is you have to have empathy for sellers because mm-hmm. it is it can frequently be seen as, well, they're coin operated or they just want to make money or they make too much money. And yes, that can be true. <laughs> However, they're also customer facing and taking some of those hard questions, big questions. And it's important to have that empathy, I think, for what it is that they need to do. Because if you're annoyed and frustrated with them, you're not going to be able to hear their problems and really want to help through the various ways that you need to help. So that's always my like first first mm-hmm. bar, if you will. Um, for like a core sales operations role. Yeah, I love Gong for this. I mean, <laughs> I, 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 you know, I grew up. I was a marketer, and um, yeah. I, I always just really wanted to know what happened in those sales conversations. And in in some of my previous jobs, that was just not possible to get it. And I just love how, if you want to now, you can go and listen to every single you know, meeting that your salespeople have with customers or prospects. And I think it can help make understanding the role and having that empathy a lot easier. Um, Gong is one technology we use and love. I'm curious as an ops leader, obviously technology is a big part of your role. As a technology vendor, I'm curious from your perspective, what did the best technology vendors do to convince you that you needed their tech in your stack? And are you able to share anything creative or interesting or something that stands out that maybe one of your previous vendors had done? Sure. So... If you talk with any of my prior technology vendors, um, I'm assuming two things would probably, um, two things would probably be revealed. (laughs) Hillary was, she was a tough, she was tough because she had high expectations of what a technology vendor needed to have, but she was clear in what those expectations were so we could meet them. So I purchased technology with a very, discerning, clear, let's really get down to business and see if there's a fit here um, because time time is money. And when you're managing a tech stack at places I've been, you know, there's 30 to 40 tools 
that you are managing both in the back office and um, for customer facing reps that need to be coordinated and orchestrated and managed and not being clear with what that looks like up front. I found I, I lost time and sometimes relationships with vendors who were like, well, couldn't you have told us that earlier? So I just tried to always be very upfront and forthcoming of where we were at, what we needed, could they meet those needs and so forth. And I found that the vendors who were able to jump right in into that area versus let's take, you know, three meetings to set the table, the folks who just kind of dove right in and said, we'll meet you with where you're at, with what you know about us, the research you've done, the back channeling and all of those pieces, we'll meet you where you're at and let's jump in in that area. That was really mm -hmm. helpful. And I think that any vendor who does that kind of earns the right to keep moving forward. The, the part though that I think is more important is being able to maintain your partnership with a company. So there are some tools out there that you just need to have in your stack that maybe it's not the best experience. Um, you know, it's maybe not the best buying experience and renewing experience. So the vendors who were proactive on, hey, we don't need to force you into a QBR but you've had some major progress in these areas, or we've seen some things really dip down. Could we have 30 minutes and mm. go through with what that was? And the companies who were very prepared, <laughs> clear agenda, clear outcomes, a pre-read, you're able to crank through that. And I, I would always be, and I'm, I'm not in that space anymore where I'm purchasing tools, mm -hmm. but I would always be happy to work with those vendors again, because they, they, they understood the challenges that most operations professionals feel which is there's a lot of tools you have to manage. You've got to figure out where you fit in. There's not enough hours in the day like there is for most folks. They feel that. But being able to lock in to that and honor that goes, I think, a long way. So I don't know if that like yeah. directly answers yeah, yeah. your question, but yeah. you've got to be a tool that you want to manage and work with when there are so many out there. And that's where people can be a great differentiator on that in their marketing teams, their sales teams, their success teams, their SEs. You know, that matters in a buying process that those folks are um, solid and trained and good to go. I love what you said about just the QBR instead of like, hey, it's time for the QBR, but talking about the value and, and what's changed and why selling it really of like why <laughs> it's not just the QBR, but here are three reasons why Yes. You're going to be interested about this data. Yeah. I love that. Well, especially if you have 40 tools, think of QBRs on those. You're looking at 120 QBRs. That's just not, that's just not manageable. Right. So yeah. I think vendors who kind of pick up on that are, um, they do a great job of that. And frankly, I try to give back on that. If you do a great job in those kinds of meetings, we'll do a case study for you. Like there's yeah. a real, there's a real business relationship that I think is important to have as well. And, you know, there are, um, you know, there are vendors that were there during tough times that we had to call in the middle of the night in prior jobs. And like that matters. And I think, I think it says a lot about what um, technology is willing to do and those folks there to make sure that, you know, their, their, their product and what they really love is, is first and foremost for others. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that. Um, I always encourage our CSMs and AEs to really develop those personal relationships with their customers because I think there's, yeah, there's kind of a, a vendor relationship that you could have with like anyone that you work with. And then there's, like you said, maybe a partnership. And then beyond that, maybe there's even a person, like you actually have a personal relationship with, with your customers. Um, um, one thing that I always like to do before uh, the podcast in my research is is look at some of the LinkedIn recommendations that people oh. have got from from their colleagues. And one thing that I noticed in yours was that there was a real trend around people talking about your you being an incredible leader. Oh, and okay. one of my questions <laughs> for you was. Yeah, like, how did you develop your leadership skills? And and there is also another trend around just how you really develop and mentor your team. So I, I'd love to hear, you know, how did you develop and hone your leadership skills? Or is that something that just came naturally for you? And then when it comes to coaching and mentoring, 
how do you approach that with your team? Well, first, that's very kind. I don't know that I've reread my recommendations recently, so uh, maybe I should. I'm a little more excited about the ones I think I've given. Um, those are more fun to write. Uh, leadership is not natural per se. I think as, as a kid and a teenager, I did do a lot of team sports and I realized early on that I was not the best player, but what I could do was I would, people would naturally come and maybe talk to me about things or how they felt, or what did you do, or how did you solve that? And so I wasn't the best player on the court, but I was frequently a team captain. And so there must be something there that I that I had that I, I don't know how to put my finger quite on that um, for a leadership piece beyond, I probably, again, like in the spirit, wasn't the IQ leader, but maybe had an EQ earlier on that was seen. But leadership was, uh, I think part of it early on was that I just was a, maybe a little more of a bull in a china shop, if to use that example, that I just early on worked a lot, I worked hard, and I really wanted to make an impact on the business. And I'm, I'm not sure why, but I, I do just like to work. And I think early on that translated to being a manager. And that was different in my 20s and i learned a lot of very hard lessons in that of the difference of being a manager and a leader and i started to identify oh that's a person that i like working for because they listen they empathize they coach they tell me when i'm doing something wrong in a way that's kind and it really makes me feel like they want to help and they're willing to advocate for me you know professionally and i went oh that's what I want to do. Managing's fine. That comes with a lot of, you know, trickiness. But I'm like, I would want to be a good leader. I, I bet I can do that if I worked at it a lot. <laughs> and so I worked at it a lot. Every time there was a training opportunity at a company to, you know, maybe learn about how to be a good leader. And I, we had a lot of that, for example, at lynda.com, which was a training company. You know, I dove right into how can I do that better and, and what can I do? So for me, yeah, maybe a little bit. I don't want to deny anything that, that's natural that was there because I just am a more bold, outgoing person. I just don't know that those are always leaders. I think back in the day that was seen as a leader. But I think what I've really had to do is dial up more of, you know, who I think are some of my favorite leaders. And I'll just use introvert, extrovert very generally. I'm a high extrovert. Some of my favorite leaders have been very strong introverts, but I've learned the most from them because they taught me the most and how they approached things and were the best leaders. And so if anything, I've tried to dial back maybe some of my extrovertism and dialed up some of those skills that I think are really powerful with, with introverts that I admire. So sorry, that's yeah, kind that's of a long great. answer no, to your I, question, but I really like that how you kind of also modeled off of you know, managers or leaders that you worked with that you enjoyed working from, I think yes. that that's an interesting takeaway. Well, um, I think maybe they went, yeah. she needs some help. Let's help mm. her because she has the potential. And then there's kind of a, you've got to pass it on. And I've tried to do mm -hmm. that as well for folks who I go, gosh, they're a good manager. I don't know that they see that they are also a leader because they maybe don't have some of the skills to do it. How can I, I help those? And those are maybe some of the recommendations that you read. That's it's amazing. You're doing something. You were doing something right there for sure. <laughs> maybe. Um, <laughs> and, and now, and and maybe this is a, a good segue into the next question because now you are in an advisory role helping other uh, insight partners, portfolio companies with their go to market. Mm -hmm. I I'd love to hear more on the background of that and specifically why you chose to work with insight. Yeah. Yeah. So insight's been around for 25 years and I was luckily able to cross paths with them when I was at an insight portfolio company, um, called Alteryx. And I was brought in to help with their IPO running their sales operations and enablement practice. And I don't want to put it in the bucket of the other VCs that I got to work with. Um, those were great. It was usually a little bit of, you know, preparing for the board, putting slides together. Where's your scorecard? What are you doing? 
And that was a great learning lesson to be really set there. What I experienced at Alteryx was they sent someone from their onsite team, which is actually what I'm a part of now. And it was this amazing woman and she interviewed all of us and put together all these findings and then delivered back a readout of ways that we could make sure that we were prepared for our IPO. And I remember asking her, what is your job? Because I just hadn't had an experience like that with someone from a venture capital firm. And she explained it and said, well, I advise companies on their go-to-market strategies. I, I listen, I learn, I have pattern identification. And then I advise on ways to make sure that you, you know, avoid the pitfalls and hopefully have some best practices. And I remember like a proverbial light bulb going off and saying, huh, that sounds really cool. And I kind of put that, you know, feather, you know, that be in my bonnet, if you will, and moved forward in things. And what I realized, Pierce, as I would be, you know, asked in different interviews or, you know, from my boss, like, well, what's what's the C-level role you want? And I would always be like, oh, uh, mm, how do I tell them? I never want to be a CEO. It's way too hard and not my jam. A COO isn't either. That's just too close to the CEO. And that's just a lot. And I don't want to be a CRO. Like I, you know, I was their partner, their advisor, all of those things. Just didn't want to do that either. And I think I realized after talking with a couple other venture capital firms who'd reached out, um, I didn't want to do, I wanted to do what Insight had done. And so when this opportunity came up to be able to um, partner with the investment side of, um, of Insight and be in that on-site side of the business, which is really advising and helping um, CEOs, CROs, you know, and various ops and enablement folks, how you can best align your strategies to be successful. I just thought that was going to be hopefully a really great fit for what my experience was for what they for what they were looking for at the time. And so it's one of those that I heard about it years ago, I kind of identified it. And then, you know, I still wanted to do some operating. And that was really fun to then go and do that at companies like MindBody and Zoom was really an amazing and unique experience to do that. And I feel like the companies I've been at from 10 million to 100 million, 100 to a billion and a billion and up um, to apply those back to other companies, because I have had some exits and that's been really great. But I don't need to do that again. I'd love to have multiple companies have exits. At the end of the day, I'm still just kind of nerdy and I just want to help. And so that's what we get to do is it's both clinical of look at the metrics. Where are you at? What is this? Right. And kind of, you know, clinical surgical. But then there's that kind of bedside nurse, you know, manner where you can come in and be like, well, here's all the things that you can do to help with that. And I think that that's a great way to make sure that our companies can, again, see the success that they, they want to see. So, yeah, well, I can speak firsthand that, you know, the uh, um, the onsite a team is like a big reason why we chose to go with insight and just having all of those resources and it you know it looked good from the outside and i i i'm not just saying this because i'm part of the portfolio but i actually think it's even better once you start working with these teams it's just amazing to not need to know all the answers or not have to figure everything out yourself to just have people like yourself to bounce ideas off of and gain all that experience that you have so it's it's it amazing so and i'm cool. <laughs> so um yeah looking forward to working with you more um okay, okay. we have one section of the podcast rapid okay. fire all right uh, we ask everyone the same question so okay. here we go what is one marketing trend that you would unsubscribe from? It's either not being able to find the unsubscribe button for emails I never subscribed to, or, nope, that's it. That's my only one. <laughs> I'm with you on that one. Where they like hide it in the footer with like the same color font. Of... Or they just don't have it. Yeah. So, even worse. Yeah. Um, on email as well. Is email dead? No, absolutely not. Email is not dead. I think it needs, I think email needs um, maybe the PR agency that was around for Kale back in the day. 
because uh, it needs to differentiate itself from chat. Um, we're big in into work life balance at NAC. What do you do for fun? Yeah, I am. I'm a 50 50 indoorsy outdoorsy. So I grew up near your your country, Canada in North Dakota. So I have a, I'm very good at being able to do puzzles and board games and all the indoors things. But now we live in California. And so I equally love um, hiking and being outside and being with our family. So I think it's some of those those normal things. But yeah, books, board games, puzzles, hiking, walking, biking, all of those things, I think, are, are, are a pretty great mix to make sure that work-life balance is there. Puzzles. That's why you're so good at sales ops. <laughs> uh, what, what's one, you've shared a lot of great advice today, but maybe what, what's one piece of advice that you've picked up over the years uh, that you think might be able to help others? Yeah, I got feedback um, it's probably a decade ago now. I was a newish manager and one of the guys on my team said, you know, this is the third meeting you've hosted where you knew the answer, but you wanted us to talk about it for an hour. If you've made the decision, just tell us you've made the decision. We can give you feedback through that lens. But at this point, you're, you're kind of wasting our time. And I went, wow, you're right. That's really good feedback. And so I've changed that of when I, if you are the leader and you have the answer or you are the, the decision maker, you don't need to have people feel falsely included if you're really not going to be including it or have them put it through the lens of this is what I'm thinking. What are these gaps and how can we make a better decision together? And that was mm -hmm. really bold of that individual to share that because I'm sure that can always be tough to give feedback up. And I've just been forever grateful. That's cool. Uh, I'm definitely guilty of having those meetings from time to time. Uh, yeah, here's another one. Uh, last one. Who else do you think we should interview on the Unsubscribe podcast? Oh, I think there's lots of people, but there is um, a wonderful woman, Tabitha Adams, that was in marketing ops with me at Ultrix. She's now at Slalom, and she is she's just a super bright fresh thought kind of leader in those areas. And I think she's just absolutely fantastic. We would love to have her on. Um, Hillary, this has been incredible. Thank you so much for spending some time with us. I thought it was a great conversation about all things sales ops from, you know, how you work with your marketing ops counterparts, what rev ops is and how you might structure that what to look for in sales operations professionals and uh, just a ton of great information on uh, how, how people can improve their go to market and uh, scale their companies. So thank you for sharing with us today. It was great having you on. Pierce, thank you so much. This was absolutely wonderful. Thanks for listening to unsubscribed a podcast created by NAC. If you enjoyed this episode of Unsubscribe, be sure to subscribe to my podcast and leave a review on your favorite podcast player. If you have any feedback or want to chat, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn or follow me on Twitter at marketing underscore 101. Cheers.